Live from, well, my backyard, this is the Hoyne Athletics pregame show. I'm your host, Nathan Spina. Alongside me is Damian Webb once again this week. Thank you. you might be asking yourself, why are you seeing this 6 o'clock and you're not at the game? Unfortunately, we are not allowed to stream this game this week, so we're bringing you a pre-recorded pregame show as it is around 11.30 our time currently as we're recording this, but we wanted to get you some sort of pregame show, and I had already typed up the script for it, so I wanted to put it to good use. So we're giving you the best that we can. I'll do my best to update our social accounts along with the Max Preps updates to give you guys a picture of what is going on in the game, as that's the best we can do. So Max Preps and both our HN Broadcasting on Instagram and Twitter, along with Holy Athletics Twitter, will be your best places to find updates for the game. Well, last week was a pretty interesting game, was it not? It was a pretty interesting game. It was uh, back and forth, but uh, Holy Name came out uh, victorious, and I think that's... Uh good key and a good start to the season. Yes, definitely. And looking at the recap, the game didn't start off that well for Holy Name. On the first drive, Padua took an early lead with a 21-yard corner end zone shot from junior quarterback Tyler Tosai to sophomore receiver Riley Cervenka. It was a nice piece of passing and as well from receiving from Cervenka to get that touchdown. As it was nowhere near a gimme shot. It was a nice nice technique from the receiver and better technique from the quarterback and just unfortunately beat the coverage. Yeah, uh, that was a Early, you know, they came out with an early drive, and they really brought it down the field, and they took the lead. But then Holy Name would come back to tie 7-7 um, seven to seven, uh, with Christian Sanchez scoring a two-yard rushing touchdown. Uh, that was really some momentum from Holy Name, and I think from there on out throughout the game, that really gave Holy Name some momentum. Yeah, and just like last year in the playoff game, Holy Name didn't give up after giving up a touchdown on the first drive. However, Padua would strike back pretty soon after the passing touchdown to Riley Cervenka once again, but the extra point would be missed, so it would be a 13-7 ball game, and Holy Name was still in it, but Padua had the momentum, and towards the end of the first half, two-minute drill, Padua throws a key interception to, to, to senior cornerback um, Kevin Pavanka, which would then lead to one of the best plays of the game from Holy Name, which would be a screen touchdown, a 43-yard touchdown to Austin Wondolowski. It was just a beautiful play drawn up, just getting the ball to him in the flats and letting him run. And I think that gave Holy Name some momentum. They went 14-3 and leading into the halftime, and that was really good for them. Uh, they came out, rested, and uh, they started right up at the uh, second half of the game. Yeah, and Padua had lots of momentum going into that third quarter. They almost scored a touchdown, but a nice defensive stop from a goal-to-go situation from Holy Name limited them to a field goal and made it a 16-14 game. Holy Name was down two going into the fourth quarter, but... Leave it to Javon Williams to make something happen. An 80-yard touchdown pass to senior receiver Kevin Pavanka. It was a nice piece of receiving from jumping over the, over the defensive back, getting the ball, staying on his feet, and running the rest of the distance into the end zone. And from that point forward, Holy Name never lo looked back. Padua had a lot of good shots, but, uh, but Will Dix's sack to end the game with about a minute left to go on 4th and 9. That was the nail in the coffin that ended the game. Holy Name ran out the clock, and here we are with a 1-0 record. Yeah, and we go into tonight, you know, facing Clyde High School. Uh, they won last week as well, so this is going to be an interesting. Uh, both teams are going in 1-0, and and we will see how, how it goes tonight. Yeah, we'll get to that recap the game later, but now it's time to announce our player of the week. If you remember, towards the end of the game last week, I, I said we'd be putting out some polls on social media pages asking for fan votes of who the player of the game was. Our crew came up with the four players of Javon Williams, Kevin Pavanka, Austin Wondolowski, and Will Dix as the nominees. As all of them played amazing games. I mean, there's many other players that you could have put in there, like Nick Kuchera especially. Just He was the first man looking in. Yeah. I think a lot of them, the four of them really actually stood out. Um, we talked about this in the pregame show about who needed to step up. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, a lot of stepping up was done last week. Yes. And after 90 votes were cast over the last couple of days, polling together the three social media polls that were out, we are pleased to announce that the winner with 34 votes out of the total 90, or 37, near 38%, is junior linebacker Will Dix after that amazing sack to end, end the game. So definitely a quick round of applause for Will. I don't know how many times I heard my, my absolute screaming and breaking the sound barrier of Will Dix with the sack heard on orientation day this past week. I probably heard it at least 10 times from people. Oh yeah, a good 10 times. Um, I was up next to Smee when he said that. That was a very loud Will Dix with the sack. It was um, hilarious, um, but it really gave Holy Name, you know, the thing. And soon after that, we heard Holy Name fan chanting, I believe that we have won. And I, that was really a setting factor for Holy Name. Yes, that piece of commentary forever immortalized, for better or for worse. But still, we'd like to congratulate William Dix for winning this this vote, and we're hoping that more players will 
we'll begin this vote in the future and that we can spread the wealth and get as many players this player of the week vote as possible. And like we promised, let's go now into the recap of Clive versus Francis to sales. We used Max Press for most of our updates and the scoring, I had to do my best as the scoring wasn't updated really to the third quarter, but it was an evenly matched going into the fourth quarter, 15 to 15. But with eight minutes left, the sales took us 18 to 15 lead with the field goal. And then four minutes later, after a very nice drive from Clyde High School, linebacker and quarterback, you heard us right, plays offense and defense. Their quarterback, Abe Morrison, has a one-yard rushing touchdown and gave Clyde a 22-18 lead that they never looked back from. And obviously on the key contributors, Abe, Abe Morrison, 16 for 28, no touchdowns, three picks, but on the ground, 17 carries, 59 yards, and one touchdown, with that touchdown being the difference in that game. Then there's Clark Norman, a junior running back, with 10 carries, 49 yards and one touchdown, and then senior receiver Cole Schwochall will go with pronunciation, five receptions for 52 yards, as it shows that they have a well-balanced offense, as we'll get to that later in the questions, as the offensive yards from both rushing and passing are pretty similar, so Clyde seems to be a very balanced team, and that could be something that could play to their advantage, or even a disadvantage in this game. Then let's go into some of those questions, as once again, we'll have five questions this week, starting with number one. This is Many answers could be here. Who impressed you the most from Holy Name last week? Um, I know that we have Will Dix as our player of the week, but I'm actually going to go with Javon Williams. Uh, Javon really stepped up. He came out strong. Uh, he had a really good game. He had a, um, a, he had 198 yards and two touchdowns yards, passing. Uh, and two touchdowns passing. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Your first game, you're coming out, uh, you know, and this is his senior year, so he's really stand out. Um, hopefully some colleges notice him and he does well in the yeah, future. From, yeah, and from what I've heard, some have. I don't know the exact colleges offhand, but he is getting some college interest, which is well-deserved, especially after last night. And then obviously the first guy on my list is Javon. He impressed me with his 198 passing yards and two touchdowns, along with his 51 rushing yards that helped with field position and extending drives. Without the legs of Javon Williams, we might have not have won that game. His rushes might have been shorter in yardage, but still, third and two, all you need is two or three yards, and bam, that's a first down. Fresh set of downs, and that gives you more life, and that really helped a lot. Number two on the list, I have Will Dix, obviously our player of the week voted. He helped with that with that game winning, game ceiling sack, I should say. That was a big part, and he also had a lot of tackles in between plays, as you saw. You'll hear his name pop up a couple times on the stream. The third player I have, this is no order in particular. This is just what I wrote up. The linebacker duo of Austin Wondolowski and Nick Kuchera impressed as usual as. Once again, they came as advertised. Even even last year, towards the end of the year, they solidified themselves as a linebacker duo for the future. Yeah, we heard Nick Cruchero's name announced a lot by the uh, Pato announcer. Perhaps wrong, but, you know, uh, that's okay. Uh, but he was really stand out, and so was on Austin Wondolowski. Yeah. The next people I have on this list would be the receiver core. Ragone, Dasco, and Cole especially. With their involvement, even though they didn't score four receptions combined with them, they all made some good plays. Ragone had a nice reception. Dasco, if you ask him, had a touchdown on his one reception, but so he fought forward and got it where Christian could punch the ball in for that touchdown. And then Cole, I mean, they had that one nice little jet sweep play, but also I think we got to talk about that block on the first play from scrimmage on offense. That was a very nice, nice block play. from Cole. Yeah. And, and then as well, the finally, I mean, there's many more, even Pavanka's touchdown, but the play calling, really. The brilliant play calling, especially on those two passing touchdowns, was brilliant from the coaches. They made it one play on the field, and then they're off the field with a touchdown. I mean, it was brilliant play calling, and, and the coaches, they obviously know what they're doing, and they impressed, and they, they should be looked at as some of the most elite coaches in Ohio, or if not in the, in the United States. They're really good at what they do, and they know what to call when a scenario calls for it. Yeah, I think the whole entire football staff, um, from Coach Wando all the way to the defensive line, O-line, um, all the coordinators, all the special teams coaches, um, they really do contribute. And I think that a lot, a lot of them have communication um, and where you go to some games and coaches aren't communicating as well. Um, and I think Holy Name really stands out as a communication program. Um, speaking for ourselves as we've been in the program, uh, it's really easy to you know, talk to your coaches, communicate with them, and they're very transparent with their players. And if you don't have transparency, it leads into problems and mistakes in the game and on the field. Yeah, and with having played, it was my first ever football season. The coaches helped me a lot to get to where I wanted to be, and I earned a starting spot after never having played, and I attributed that a lot to the coaches that helped me through it, especially guys like Coach House or Coach Les. They really helped with my understanding of the football, and they do that with everyone. It's, it just shows how good the coaching is that you could take people from anywhere, any other 
football background, and they can make them stars in this program. And that's and that's how we continue to be, ma remain competitive. No, no doubt, Holy Names coaching staff does push you hard, but they they want the best for you, and they see the best in you, and they see potential in every single student that walks into that football program, and they'll make something work. You know, zero experience, five years experience, um, you'll still be an important part of the Holy Name football team. Exactly. Now bring us to question number two, as advertised before. Clyde passed for 155 yards last week and ran for 149, but had three other touchdowns on the ground. Holy Name only allowed 64 passing yards and 26 on the ground last week. With that, does Holy Name need to focus on defending the run more or defending the pass? Um, I'd say Holy Name needs to um, really focus on defending the pass. Um, we had 155 yards from Clyde last week, um, but Holy Name only allowed 64 if they can keep that, that same momentum, that same uh, drive and same power that will allow them to stop, um, I think Holy Name could come out with the victory if they do that. Yeah, and in my notes, I do have defending the pass should be a priority because it says two touchdowns we gave up passing on the board. It realistically could have been more. There was the one touchdown from tight end Jeremy Borky that was called back due to holding, I believe. Mm -hmm. And there were two red zone on that goal line stand where we had, where Tosai had an open receiver, but just overshot him twice in a row on a nice little slant route. If we, can get, if we can get a little tighter defense on those, more tight on the on man coverage, and especially limiting the passing yards, we can let them catch the ball. That's no issue. Let them catch the ball, that's fine. We just can't let them get more yards. Like a five-yard check down on third and ten, no issue. All you, you can let up nine yards, you can't let up ten. And despite three picks from A. Morissette, it was week one, and he still threw the ball pretty well. It was seen by the 155 yards. And, and just saying, if you're a quarterback who also plays linebacker, you are the leader of, of both sides of the ball. Yeah. It takes an extremely high football IQ, and it's very difficult to do, even for the smartest of football players, to play both sides of the ball and can communicate well like Morrison does. And you could tell that maybe just he had a rough week with, with interceptions. I wouldn't be surprised if he comes back with some vengeance this week and starts throwing the ball as well as he can and leading the defense and the offense. I mean, I, once, I, once I heard that their quarterback also played linebacker, I, I was just shocked for a good couple minutes. It's just very impressive. Yeah. But also defending the run is key, definitely, considering that all three of their touchdowns did come on the ground last week because they might try to keep the game plan the same. But if we can limit their rush game like we did to Marquise Hall last week, who was a very solid running back, very solid. only letting him 26 yards or so last week, we'll be in very good shape to win this week. Which will then lead to question number three of our own running back, Christian Sanchez. He averaged less than two yards per carry last week. What is the key to giving him the best chances to increase that average this week? Um, I think the key would be for uh, Christian, he needs to, you know, keep his head focused, um, you know, communicate with the quarterback, uh, communicate with Javon, um, and really just understand his team. Um, we have a big team. It's hard to understand, you know, 70-plus people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if it's anywhere near that number, but you got to think about it. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people in the stands. And um, I think what's going to be key is um, the O-line, you know, protecting – um, and blocking hard, uh, we have seen some really good blocks and some really good holds, um, and we have some we have some beef on that line. So, mm -hmm. I uh, I think that if they keep standing, you know, the old line is going to get better every single week, and uh, Christian will be able to get more yards per carry. Yeah, and here's my logic behind this: I would change nothing of our running approach. Keep handing Sanchez the ball the way we would. But keep in mind, Pat was last game last season in November was holy name. Their first game this season, holy name. name. They had a full nine months to prepare for Christian Sanchez while Clyde has one week. And that could be a big difference. Like If you play a team twice in a row, you're going to be expecting them. There's a reason why things work better. Like Marquise Hall struggled in the first game against holy name last year. The second game, the first thing he did was score a 65-yard rushing touchdown. Mm -hmm. They evolved throughout the season, and preparing is different. And Clyde might look at it and say, okay, 198 passing yards. How do we limit this? Opposed to looking at Sanchez's 27 or so yards saying, how do we limit this? If you, under Christ if you underestimate Christian Sanchez, it's not going to end well. No. We know Christian Sanchez, what he can do, and I believe he'll show it this week, and I believe that give him the ball, he'll power through and he'll have some nice runs this week. And, and if he can do that, you'll, you'll see Derrick Henry on display before the NFL season even begins. Yeah. As we've maintained on here, Derrick Henry Jr. should be his nickname, and I will maintain that as long as he stays a wrecking ball archetype of a running back. And then his partner in crime, Javon Williams, the other beast in the, in the rushing game, but also in the passing game, with him throw, throwing for almost 200 yards and two passing touchdowns. Should we pass the ball a little more often? 
Um, I think we uh, I think we should pass the ball a little bit more often. Uh, we have Christian and he needs his uh, yards, but I also think that we need to switch it up sometimes. Pass the ball, um, get downfield more. But we also sometimes it depends on the team. You can't take that risk. Um, you know, we know that certain teams have good defensive backs and people that are really you know on the field and stand out. But I think the most important thing is that. Um, we need to keep keep the momentum changing. So, you know, that way Clyde doesn't know what's hitting him next. Whoever we face doesn't know who's hitting him next. I mean, like you said earlier, they could be focusing on one thing and we could hit him with another thing. So I think that Holy Name has both those capabilities and I think we should use them. Yeah, I believe so. I mean, having a mix of both should be done. But if we can pass the ball more, that'd be great. Like. Our checkdowns work really well. I mean, NFL legends such as Eli Manning, well, you can define NFL legend term loosely, but <laughs> Eli Manning, but a definite NFL legend, Tom Brady, they're known for doing checkdown passes, and look how far it got them in there in at least one Hall of Fame career, maybe two, depending. If you, I don't want to start any controversy saying Eli Manning's a Hall of Famer or it's not. But both of them use checkdowns very effectively in their careers, and it looks like Javon's being able to pass the ball well in checkdowns and even maybe take a calculated risk or two throughout the game. Look, looking at the pass to Pavanka, it was a calculated risk, and it paid off well. You can't just take dumb shots downfield, yeah. but if you have a calculated idea and you think you can hit the receiver, by all means, I suggest taking that option, and you can get a big chunk yard play. And if, if Javon can continue to pass and run like he did last week, and ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat this season to, wa to watch an electric quarterback play at his best. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a very entertaining season to watch him play, assuming he can keep up this level of play. Yeah, I think and also our coaches are going to push him to do that. Um, our coaches make really good plays on the sidelines. Um, they, they see the situations. They monitor them. They, they put a lot of homework in. And if you think that a coach is just there at practice to yell at you and make you a better player, they're not. They're spending – a good majority of our time. Our guidance counselor is a football coach. Um, from, you know, 8 to 3 o'clock, he's in his guidance office, and then 3 to, what, 7 o'clock at night? At least 7 o'clock. At least 7. Um, he's focusing on football stuff. So think about the incredible um, patience it takes to be a football coach and to, you know, work through plans for games and to, you know, work to, to – to come out with the W, and that's that's what we have to do. Yep. And the final question in our question section. With these teams being unfamiliar with each other, because I, I tried doing the research, I don't know the last time that these two teams played each other, if at all. So do you think that unfamiliarity between the two teams will change anything in either the game plan, or will it really affect them? Um, I think that it will um, change, because um, you got to think about it. Sometimes you go into a match and you go, oh, they don't look so hot. We're going to beat them. There's a sense of cockiness. Um, but I don't think that's going to be from the Holy Name side. It could be from the Clyde side. But I really think that um, you have to go into a game as it's a regular season game. It's not, you know, it's not your rivalry, but it's not your, you know, player you play every single, uh, your team that you play every single year. Um, so I think that you have to go in with a mindset of that this is a team that we're trying to beat. It doesn't matter if they're in our division. It doesn't matter if they're in our conference. It matters if we think we could come out with that victory. And I think that's the mental aspect of football is that you always have to have that positive attitude no matter who your opponent is, no matter where they're from. Schools play, you know, other schools from different states. I mean, come on, you never see them practice or anything like that. You've never really been there involved in the program. So it's really a different opportunity when you get to face another team. So I think that you got to keep your head up and, you know, go in with a positive attitude. And that's a yeah. key factor. Yeah. I think st if you can stick to what works, nothing will change. But also experiment a little. If there's a play that you want to try, this is the team to try it against because right. the rest of our schedule we've played against. Yeah. Depending who we get next week, that might not be the same statement. But for most of the teams that on our schedule, we've played them before. They know what we have. This is our experimentation week that we can use and change things. But but a quote from a song that is very fitting, I change by not changing at all. If we can keep our identity the same exact no matter who we play, it can be a big deal. And we can run the ball more potentially with Christian. If Clyde sees that he only had 27 yards last week, they might, fo they might focus on the passing side of it. And then Christian Sanchez can then run the ball as, from what I've heard, this is a 3-5. Yeah. If he can find the right gap, he can get a nice five-yard play before a linebacker takes him down. Or if he can get past that second level and off to the races, we can be looking good. It just... 
We need to play the w- football the way we've played it for the last couple of years. Those last couple of years, we've made it really far in the playoffs. If you can play that solid football that got us there and keep our identity, then I think we can take advantage of this unfamiliarity, keep things the same, and have it not let us not affect us. Yeah. All that matters, it's 11 on 11. It doesn't matter who else is on that other team. It's 11 versus 11. Right. Beat your guy, and that's all you can do. And it really doesn't matter where they're at. You know what I mean? There's, they're going to be in different formations. They're going to be in different lineups. So, you know, and it's going to be different players. You know, they could be subbing players in. It could be somebody that's really good, somebody that's a senior uh, against a sophomore. It's going to be – it's different. And that's the thing I like about football is it's diverse. Um, and playing different teams gives you a certain um, – aspect of diversity yeah and like football terms any given sunday or in our case a friday but even ever ever, any given sunday friday whatever day you play football anyone can step up and be the hero and i think that's what you're going to see today any given friday someone's going to step up and with that let's go to our around the ground section looking at last week in first place i'm in first place with a five and two record woo that's a little anticlimactic because Damian's also in first place with a 5-2 two two. record. But if you remember, we predicted eight games. Ignatius versus Springfield was canceled due to inclement weather. Unfortunate, but we didn't get another one wrong. There you go. Yeah, that's one right. <laughs> <laughs> Is that one right or one wrong? Just like the, just like the old Browns when we were going 0-16, we didn't lose this week. You've got to have that mentality with some of these predictions. Yeah. As we are by no means geniuses, we look at the games and make a prediction of who we think is going to win. Yeah. We have 12 games, I believe, to predict this week. So, starting with game number one, starting with the heavy hitter, St. Ignatius versus Menor at First Energy Stadium. Damian, who do you think is going to win this matchup? Um, I'm going to go with St. Ignatius on this one. Um, you know, St. Ignatius is um, a really good football program. I talked about this last week. Um, but at First Energy Stadium, so, you know, this mentality of, oh, we're in Cleveland, we're playing where the Browns play, this is something big. I think St. Ignatius is going to have a great advantage on that. Um, because I know a lot of their players get to work in camps with uh, the Browns and uh, many other things. So I think St. Ignatius has a great opportunity to take the win this week. Yeah, I also agree that St. Ignatius will take the win this week. Their game got canceled, so they have extra time to rest. And they've already gone through a week of prep. So this, so basically with, without the, the knocks you can get from playing a football game, they prepared for a football game, and now they have extra time to pre- prepare. And both Iggy and Menor are good teams. They played each other in the playoffs last year. I think St. Ignatius will get the upper hand and start their season 1-0. Game number two, Perkins versus Elyria Catholic. Damian, who do you think is going to win this game? Um, i got to say Elyria Catholic. Um, like I said uh, last year as well, um, last week as well, um, Elyria Catholic, you know, did really good last year. Um, and I know that we face Elyria Catholic soon. Um, but I think that Elyria Catholic is going to come out with this because um, this is like a big um, thing for them. Um, I know several people that go to Elyria Catholic. Um, they were talking about how this game is kind of hype for them, and they're really expecting a win. So I'm going to go with them and hope they uh, get the win there. I'm back in the Panthers of Elyria Catholic to go to, to start the season 2-0. They played really well last week. They have some star players. Their quarterback, Brady Cook, Levi Ellis. They have a lot of good players on that team, some getting offers for colleges. They're a very good team. I think they can beat this Perkins team because last week they played Elyria, a team where they – they were up by a decent amount and then lost it last year. And then this year they were able to put all that behind them and win the game. I think that momentum carries as momentum is everything in football. Like I said, any given Absolutely. Sunday, anything can happen. But I'm backing Elyria Catholic this week. Game number three, Lakewood versus Bay. Damian, who do you think is going to win? I got to go with Bay on this one. And Bay has always been a tough competitor. Um, they, they're from football, baseball, softball, all their sports. Um, they really strive and um, they're really good. Um, They've, they, come, they come and go, and they go through teams left and right. Um, and I think that from seeing last year, Holy Name beating Lakewood, I have to go with Bay on this one. Bay, uh, they're a good football program, and we wish them luck in their season. I think that's who I'm going to go with. Yeah, we beat Bay last year in the playoffs. That was our first playoff game. I believe they're going to beat Lakewood. No bias here, even though I do have Lakewood, not Lakewood ties. I have Bay Village ties as I guest played soccer there when I used to play back in the day. But I think Bay Village is a very good football program. I think Bay Village will just have a slight edge over Lakewood. I don't know why, it's just one of those gut feelings. I think Bay Village is going to win this week. Oh, absolutely. Going to game number four, Buckeye versus Steel. Who do you think is going to win? I got to go with Buckeye on this one. Uh, Buckeye, like, you know, like a lot of these teams, they're tough competitors. Um, and... 
you know, they we go back and forth with them in sports, you know, win and lose it, win and losses. Um, but I got to go with Buckeye. I've seen a lot of competition from Buckeye over the last my last two, almost three years here yeah. at Holy Name. So, um, yeah, I got to really say Buckeye, I think, on this one. I'm going to agree with Buckeye on this one. The last year they beat us the game in a field goal as their kicker slash Taysom Hill, essentially. Basically scored 18 of the 24 points in that game. He is no longer there, but I think Buckeye, they're going to play solid. And Steele had, had a loss of, I think, around 40 points against Valley Forge. Like we said, momentum is everything. Based on that, I think Buckeye is going to have the upper hand over Steele, and the Amherst side will drop to 0-2 on the season, while Buckeye will take a win. Going to game number five, which I think we might differ on this one. Parma versus Fairview. Who do you have winning? Um, I have Fairview winning, uh, and I know that they lost last week to Lutheran West, um, but I think that with that loss and uh, with some time that they're going to come back and uh, hopefully have a 1-1 one and -one record after their game. All right, I lied. I do not disagree. I believe Fairview will win. Look at this matchup last year. Parma did beat them 13-8 to last year, but I think that has to ignite something in Fairview that they want to get this one back, especially early in the season. I think that will ignite them to win. It might be a scrappy football game as seen by last year, but I think they'll definitely have a good shot, and I think Fairview takes the win. Yeah, I think um, early games where you want to really redeem yourself is a great opportunity to focus on. I know from the Holy Name side, you know, when we hear we're facing Paddle our first game, that's really hype. That's the focus in the weight room from November all the way until the, you know, like next year. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really tough. I mean, they really focus on that. And um, I think redemption is a key to football. And I think you got to come out and always have that mentality that we can do this. Yeah. And just like some of these rivalry games, it's like Christmas. It happens once, once a year. Unless Christmas happens twice a year like it did for Holy Name and Padua last year. But... These matchups, they've only happened a certain amount of times every year. you got to take the wins when you can. I think Fairview will capitalize. And with that, moving on to another Parma team, Game 6, Cuyahoga Falls versus Normandy. Who do you have winning that game? i got to go with Cuyahoga Falls on this one. Um, I haven't really watched much between Cuyahoga Falls and Normandy. I know from experience last year that Normandy, they had a little bit of a rough season. They did good, though. Um, so I'm going to go with uh, Cuyahoga Falls on this one. They... They did some good stuff last year, too. And just so you know, it's not scripted. I do have Normandy winning. We finally have a disagreement here. Yeah. Normandy started the season 1-0. They won last week. And this week, they, they beat Cuyahoga Falls. That was our one win last season. And if you look at the Normandy side, they can already double their win tally and start the season 2-0. I think that momentum, not only from last year, but from last week, will carry over as Cuyahoga Falls started the season 0-1. I think Normandy will do everything they can. And I believe that at the end of tonight, that Normandy will be a 2-0 football team. Maybe. Game seven on here, Green versus North Olmstead. Damien, who do you think is going to win? I got to go with Green on this one. Um, you know, North Olmstead, they're, they're an okay football program, not to knock them or anything. Um, but, you know, schools like Green, they're, you know, they really focus on these things. And that's kind of their most important sport if you, you know, it's, it's sad to say, but that's the most important sport at, you know, schools like that. So I'm going to go with Green on that one. I believe Green will win as well as looking at the rankings, I, I have a gut feeling Green will win. And on paper, according to the rankings, they are the better team. I think North Olmstead will play well, but I think Green will just get an upper hand. As they made it decently far in the playoffs, if I remember. If I'm, if I'm yeah. mistaken, I apologize. But I believe they made it pretty far last year. And I think that they're continuing to play their good football. All right, game number eight, Rocky River versus Firelands. I got to go with Rocky River on this one. Um, I know a lot of people that go to Rocky River, um, you know, they talk about they talk about Firelands all the time. It's not too far, you know. You got Rocky River, and then you got Amherst, you know, Lorraine. So um, I gotta go with Rocky River. Rocky River, um, good football program. They have really great coaches. Um, I remember from freshman football, um, they they had some very they had a big team, um, and we've seen a lot of guys stand out. So you can only imagine how they are as juniors now. Um, so that's where really how I'm going off of that one. Yeah. Yeah, we beat. Yeah, our freshman team beat Rocky River our freshman year. I remember that game. But we we went two and four. That was our second win of the season. And I remember that feeling against that Rocky River team. There was some, there was some energy there. But that that Rocky River team, they played very physically. I know that as well from being on the line. So at those guys now being juniors, I think that that will be enough as well. I think Rocky River, great football program. I think they'll take the win over Firelands tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Game nine, Westlake versus Rhodes. Damian, who do you have winning? 
I got to go with Westlake High School. Um, you know, like I said, a lot of athletes out there, um, they're encouraged to play multiple sports. Um, you know, you see schools like Avon Lake, you know, Avon, all these kids, they really play a lot of sports. I know people that go to Avon, they play four sports in a year. I mean, that's a sport, you know, you're dedicated your whole entire school year. Um, so I really got to go with uh, Westlake on this one. Uh, great environment. They also have, you know, a lot of funding that helps and contributes to their program. So I think they're going to come out good tonight. Our second disagreement, I believe that Rhodes is going to win tonight. My logic behind this, Rhodes played a great Gilmore team last week and lost by 20. They were very competitive in that game, and I think that this week, after coming off that, after that experience, I think that'll be enough just to get them over the hump. It's going to be probably a close game, but I think Rhodes will just do enough to win the game. Absolutely. All right, using soccer terminology, the Lakota Derby here. Lakota East versus Lakota West. Damien, who do you have winning? Man, uh, it's a lot of Lakota, um, but not Dakota. Um, anyways, um... I gotta go with Lakota East. If I'm not mistaken, they won last week their game, um, their matchup. Was it Lakota East? No, Lakota West won oh, last week. Lakota West won. But you know, uh, this is a rivalry right here, so you know, what, who knows what can happen. I'm gonna go with the victors of last week, Lakota West. I think they're gonna continue their season, go two and zero. It's gonna be a close game. You can throw out records of any rivalry game. Just look at just look at any Browns game, even when we weren't good a couple years ago. Every rivalry game, it didn't matter what the record was. It just mattered for that time period the game went on of who played better. And I think that's what tonight's going to be. It's probably going to be a close, hard-fought matchup. Maybe some bad blood between them, but I think Lakota West will take the win. Game 11, St. Ed's versus Central Catholic. And no, we're not reusing last week's script. This is Pittsburgh Central Catholic opposed to Toledo Central Catholic. Same result for Ed's as another win. Yeah, I think so. St. Ed's is going to come out, you know, they're beating teams named Central left and right, so I, uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's a thing, you know, maybe it's a superstition, but I think St. Ed's is going to come out with a win. I do agree that, that Ed's on their on Groundhog Day, essentially. Yeah. They're waking up playing the same team. I believe they're gonna, going to beat Pittsburgh Central Catholic. State champions, what more do we need to say? State right. champions, Division One. very good football program. That's all, that's all you can say about Ed's. Right, they're already, you know, this is their second game. They're driving through teams real fast. Um, I know a lot of kids that are involved in that football program. Um, that football program works very hard. Um, they work hours upon hours. And I don't know if they've started school yet, but that is really tough on some of those student athletes. I, I must admit that um, playing football is tough on student athletes, but I believe that, you know, if you're really dedicated to it, you'll become a great football player and successful in your academics. Yeah. And the final game, they smet Jesuit from, get this, Missouri versus Springfield. No, not Springfield, Illinois. No, Springfield, Ohio. From seeing this, I was Googling other games to do for this. This is the last one of predictions. And looking up, I saw an article, Springfield AD look, looking hard to find a matchup, finds one in Missouri. I click on it, I read it. I was impressed. I think we have to predict this game. It's impressive the sole fact that they fought that hard to get a team to play against them from Missouri, but who do you think is going to win that game? Well, I got to say, got to give them some props, you know. Going out of the way, the coaching staff, to find a team for their kids to play, you know, maybe it's not comfortable for them, but, you know, it's different. It's going to teach these uh, football players, you know, diversity in the on the field and give them some experience. But I have to go with Springfield. And the reason is because that St. Ignatius Springfield game got canceled. You know, uh, like you said earlier for St. Ignatius, it gave them some time to rest. They got two weeks basically of practice at this moment. Um, and then they're going to go into a game tonight and, you know, hopefully they win. Yeah. With this game being a 1230 start tomorrow, I mean, that's the only Saturday game on our docket. But Despite there potentially being jet lag or whatnot, I believe that the state runner-up Springfield will win. Similar reasoning to Damien as an extra week of rest and practice behind them. And I also think with being the state runners up, I think they can beat this this Jesuit team. I think they're going to go out there and play hard because keep in mind, they sought this team out. If they're not confident going into this game, then why would you seek a team out to play? And I think that will carry them over. It might be a close physical game. I don't know what this Missouri team has to offer. I don't watch Missouri football in my spare time, despite contrary belief. I but, think I think their momentum of you know winning, oh well, being running up, a runners up last year, um, that'll really drive into this season. Um, I think they're going to have a great season, um, and I think for sure we'll see them in the playoffs sometime. 
you know, unless they have a horrible season, but I don't think that's going to be the case. Yeah, I thought they were going to take out their anger of losing to Eds on Iggy last week. Now this team has, well, this new team will be the one who will probably take it. Springfield, I think they'll win. And this will bring us to our final segment of our pregame show. The keys to victory. I have four bullet points written down, so we'll alternate. We'll talk about them. Start with number one. Stick to the basics that worked last week. Stick to the run. Stick to the pass. Stick to what works. Play the defense and keep the identity that we know because it's worked. You don't change up your whole offense after one week. You keep things consistent. Changing by not changing at all is really big in football, and if we can do that well tonight, I believe we can win the game. Right, which brings us to our next point, you know, keep identity on both sides of the line. So we need to go into this game, you know, this is our offense and this is our defense, and we – offense, defense. Um, but I really think that's what makes a football team, and I think that we have to, you know, focus on what's at stake here. You know, we're facing a team we have no clue about. And I think that we have to keep this identity of we're an offense – we need to stop that ball. We need to stop those rushing yards, passing yards. And then the defense, you know, they need to step up, you know, and do their best. I think I just said that backwards. But anyways, you get the point. They really got to step up on both sides and keep their ground. Uh, that's the key. Yep. Third thing, get as many people involved as possible and make plays. No, no, I'm not saying point people from the crowd to play here. I'm saying spread the wealth to as many people as we can. Looking at the re- at the receptions, only one receiver had more than one catch last week, and that was Austin Wondolowski. Spreading out the, the wealth as many people as possible, getting as many receivers, runners of the ball as, as involved as possible, that would be a big thing because they'll never know who to expect the ball to go to. Right. Variance is key in football, and if, and if a lot of those guys, pretty similar in talent, Get the ball at any of them, they're not going to know what to expect. Yeah, I think the one thing about Holy Name practices is they work in groups. And, you know, you see uh, guy number one, you know, and, and you want to be like guy number one, and you, you want to be one, two, and three. So when you go out there, a coach says, all right, you're in. you got to really show what you're for. And I think that a lot of the younger guys are trying to do that. And I think that Holy Name has the ability to do that, that they can switch guys in and out um, to keep it, you know, a, kind of a mystery. Kind of like uh, what's lurking in the dark for the team. So uh, I think that's a great advantage Holy Name does have. Um, so we have to ignore the crowd noise because this team is an hour away. Um, so I don't think many people are going to travel. I don't think you think many I people are going to travel. From either. the people I've talked to, I, th- I don't know what, what's going on. I don't know how many people are going to commute to the game. But whoever is there, we got we got to cheer on the team. We're going we're gonna to be there. We're going to be doing the Max Rats updates. We'll, we'll, t- we'll have the strength of the whole student section in us right now. We're going to do it? I, yeah, I think we're going to have to do um, I think that, I mean, we might be the only ones there. Uh, you got the parents, probably, of you know, our football yeah. players, and maybe their siblings. But, you know, I can't say who, how many people are going to be there. I mean, we could go out there, and who knows? Um, yeah. I know there, there wasn't a bus for this one or anything like that, but um, I know that we'll be out there. The marching band will be out there, so holy, hopefully that'll hope the Holy Name football team, you know, and let's hype them up. Um, this is unknown territory for the boys, yeah. so that's really uh, yeah. yeah, you never know how many are going to get show up on any given day. We might be wrong that there might be everyone possible known a man there. We don't know, yeah. but just I'm just comparing us to the Riverside game last year. The student section, maybe ten people, maybe. I was not present for that one. I was um, away with some family matters, but I did see, you know, that there was not many people there. Many yeah, not of my ma- friends didn't go. So. Yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the freshman football players who are now on varsity were there at those games. That was the student section. But we, we're strength in numbers, but we're also strength in few. We we work with whatever we got, and that's how we play our football. It didn't matter in playoff games where not many people may have traveled. We made the best of what we had. I hope that you know maybe. Um, since there is going to be no live stream, that maybe we will see some parents there and we'll see some students there. Um, but, you know, it's an hour away. Anyways, um, it's, uh, it's going to be a great football game tonight. Um, it's going to be a great week, and then uh, next week we'll be back with some football, hopefully. And then finally, to end the show, just some housekeeping matters. We do want to thank our former cameraman, Tyler Huss, who unfortunately has to step away from the broadcasting. We thank him for his help last year as... We really started. He was one of one of the original three on our first stream mm-hmm. that we found when we took over at Vaj Day last year. We do appreciate him, and we definitely wish him the the best of luck with all he has to do. 
which means that we'll have a new member joining us, which it might be next week if we get a game. If not, it'll be our home opener against Leary Catholic. And just to kind of tease who it is, Cam Regazzo is not here. But if you thought one Regazzo wasn't enough, I can, I can assure you, I think two will be plenty, as you'll be able to see that next week or whenever. But there it is. So, yeah, that, that will conclude our pregame show. Once again, we'd like to remind you that we'll be giving the Max Prep updates. To, and we like to follow our social media accounts, Holy Name Broadcasting on Twitter and Instagram for updates, along with Holy Name Athletics on Twitter for updates during the game. I've been Nathan Spinney. Alongside me, Damian Webb. We, we hope you guys enjoyed the game, whichever, whichever way you find it. And